In this video podcast, I'm going to be sharing some personal details about my life story, about my life experience. Please excuse the hoarse voice, but I I feel urged, I feel compelled to share more of my personal experiences, things that have taught me about the world that I live in today. The ultimate teacher in my life has been my life experiences. And there's many ways we can learn about reality. Sometimes we learn through a book. Sometimes we get an epiphany. Sometimes it's through certain life experiences and challenges that we've gone through and experiences that we've had that have led us to certain understandings. I'm going to talk in this podcast about my relationship with my parents for the first time. And there's no one that has the power to stop me from speaking my truth and speaking my experience and what I learned from it. What I want to say right here and now is the, the first systems of control that I rebelled against in this incarnation was rebelling against the control from my parents. I am a single child, as they say, um, born to a, a fairly unique family background. We're born into one with families from two different parts of the world. And the post 9-11 world, as regular viewers, long-term viewers of mine know, it's been, um, you know, for a lot of different reasons, it's been complicated. And I've been filled with a lot of emotions that have come from some very specific places. So I'm going to try to share some of that in this video podcast. And I'm going to be trying to do more of these podcasts as time goes on. Here in the RV living off-grid, without conventional power, miles from anyone, and it seems to be the right place to do this. So I was born February 25th, 1980, to a mother, American mother, white mother from Oregon, and a father from Afghanistan who migrated here in 1967 to go to school. Uh, at that time, there were many Afghans that were coming to the United States, earning a education, there was a massive westernization taking process then in the country. So through um, the family connections, the Ansari family connections, my grandfather, my father's father, uh, I believe, served in some form of government. Again, this is pre-Taliban, uh, Kabul, Afghanistan, on its way to being westernized, developing uh, irrigation and cultivating new farming techniques basically becoming more of a nation. And Afghanistan is, is not a very old nation. But I was born here in the States. I was born in Portland, Oregon, a city that I've done so many broadcasts from. And my dad's story is a little more, um, more involved. I don't know everything to my father's story. What I do know is that for about 10 years, before I met my mother, uh, he, he lived in Chicago, we lived in Kentucky, he lived in uh, various parts of the United States, and he was on his, uh, his path to get an education, and he eventually did earn a master's degree from Portland State University, and I believe he speaks five to six languages. He is intelligent on a level, and has very much involved himself in the world of uh, academia here in the United States as well as government, as I'll get into later. So we met my mom in 1977 in German class. Uh, my mother, uh, I would say, probably third generation Oregonian, maybe maybe more than that, uh, with a genetic background uh, to Austria. Uh, and I'm sure there's other Germanic bloodlines as well. On the grandmother's side, there's a little French, a little bit of Welch, maybe Irish. There was uh, an interview I did with my grandmother before she passed away years ago, my grandmother on my uh, mother's side. And she gave us, basically gave me a breakdown of the genealogy on her side and her, um, her ex-husband being my grandfather on my mother's side. And I'm going to be leaving out names. And so I would say that it's a pretty unique bloodline or it's a, it's a pretty unique in my eyes, and rare, a combination of genetics to come together and bring forth a, a form of life. And so I was born in 1980, and to speak to uh, 
that time period between my parents, the divorce occurred shortly after my birth. And I, I don't really remember anything then. I have memories of being back on the farm in Aurora, Oregon, which is south of Portland. And that's where I spent many of my childhood years uh, on the farm. But my parents did separate. My father was abusive. And I believe there was some sort of scenario where he was drunk. And he, uh, when my mom went to call the police, he pulled the cord out of the wall to basically prevent her from calling the police. They uh, were sharing an apartment at the time on southeast, around southeast 20th and Burnside. So my grandfather came out. Uh, grandfather, you're going to learn more about him. World War II vet, hunter, fisherman, carpenter, uh, built his own home, uh, real estate, owned several businesses, uh, pilot, adventure, traveler. Uh, I, I think I covered the, the most important basics right there, but it, he did own his own carpet business. It's called Nagel Fur Covering. It's still down there to this day under new ownership. Grandfather passed away the day before my first uh, TV show, my first recording, or day after. And I remember my grandfather saying, I don't want to leave this world till you're on the path that you're on. So oddly enough, he passed away the day after my first recording. I'm going to share a little bit about my experiences with my grandfather, some of the things that I learned from my grandfather, who was a very instrumental force in my life growing up as a male I don't know if I would say a role model, but father figure, basically. And someone that uh, tried to bring a little discipline in my life at one point as well, as well as help. My father, however, going back to the, uh, the period of my, uh, right after my birth. Uh, my grandfather came up to get my mother and take my mother from Portland back down to Aurora. And from what I understand, that was a dark period for my father, a lot of alcoholism. And uh, there's quite a few trees outside the old property in Aurora. We had 40 acres, orchard trees, hazelnuts. And it was said, or at least I was told at a young age, that my father wanted to kidnap me and take me back to Afghanistan, or at least these threats were made. And so from an early age, hearing about this, I was, in a way, preconditioned to fear my father. And not necessarily for bad reason, as I found out later on in my life. And my life story and the things that you know about me and then the things you're going to find out about my childhood and some of the things that happened and who my father really is, in a way, in a sense, today in this day and age. It, this is why I refer to my story being like Luke Skywalker realizing Darth Vader is his father. It's the story of duality, of incarnating into a family in a situation that is so opposite, that is so at times adverse and detrimental to your own spirit, even though you came from their body or their bodies, coming from parent or parents. And my story, dealing with rebellion from control, is in relation to living with both my mother and my father and what I've learned about dominating men and women and the, the archon like state of mind of thinking that you own or control what you have helped bring into this world. Thus viewing that as property and something that you rule over and how that influences behavior and how you treat your children and your relationship with your children when they become an adult. And I'm going to have to pause here and there because my relationship with my parents is only one particular aspect of a larger whole. But it's, it's pretty much where I'm going to start from. And I'm probably not going to be able to get into everything in this first podcast about my life. So this is really going to be about my early childhood leading into my adulthood and the beginning of OTB TV. Beyond that, I'm going to save that for another time, but I'm going to focus this recording on my first memories 
and things that I can remember at least up until my mid-20s. So from a young age, living on the farm in Aurora, in a house that my grandfather built with his bare hands in the 60s. There was a sense of security from the city, from the world. Now, even though my grandmother, you know, she would watch CNN, one of those old school um, projection televisions, you know, with the huge old screen. And there were some chickens and there was a garden. I wouldn't really describe it as fully off the grid, but basically a, a, a farmhouse with dogs running around and a lot of space. And uh, what I'm going to tell you is my grandfather was one of the most stable individuals that I've ever gotten a chance to know up close in person because of what he built for his family. And I know that there's a lot of older men in this country that I, I feel in a way, though, in that particular period of time where people were coming back from World War II, there was a lot of land to inherit. So my, my grandfather in that time in the 50s, coming back from World War II, he, he flew B-29s over Japan. He, he served in the Pacific. He came back and he was a mailman for years. And he met my grandmother who was a nurse at Good Samaritan Hospital. Uh, ironically, same hospital I would be born in, in the year 1980, which is on Northwest 23rd. And so he was back in Aurora. He was de de delivering mail. They lived in downtown Aurora. And at some point, he opened up his own business. As Aurora was booming and people were moving in, he was laying linoleum. He was laying carpet. He was helping people build their homes. And that positive energy is really what brought me into this world, having that, that stable place. I would have been very different. My life would have been very different if I grew up in the ghetto. Or if I grew up in certain environments, or if I exposed to certain things. In a way, my mother did shelter me from certain things, as I was constantly reminded. Of course, there was a, quite a bit of control that went with that so-called sheltering and protecting. Psychological. So those early years were uh, a mixed bag of years. I can remember... This was a period of living on the farm. My uncle was on the farm. One year younger than um, my mother. <coughs> she was born in 60. He was born in 61. My uncle was a real uh, rabble rouser, in a way. Not, not in terms of activism. He was a partier. He was a cokehead. He was a meth head. He worked on cars. He drove them fast. He was known to drive cars fast. It was a big part of his persona. He was, he was an atypical... Uh, 1970s, 1980s, uh, would be cool guy. And in a way, I thought my uncle was cool. Uh, sometimes when he was amped up, he'd wrestle with me, and I never had a male to wrestle with, so I remember we'd wrestle, and sometimes he'd play a little bit rough. And I remember those were years where there were there was a lot of control for my mother to stay in sight. And I can tell you that there were... Um, there were other places that we lived in this time period. Living with a single mother, so I'm going with the mother. In 1984, we're living in downtown Seattle, Washington. And this is uh, a couple years after having a very, I guess, a very interesting character come into my life through the form of one of her boyfriends. And this was 1982, 1983, 1984. This guy that came into my life was a guy that was very special to me. And in a way, I was special to him due to my rela his relationship to my mother. But there's a lot of things that I learned from this gentleman throughout my life leading up to just a few years ago. And so it was, it was in those early years of my life that there was a fatherly uh, role model that was there for me early on. And I'm going to talk more about this person later because there, there was a gap in between when they were seeing each other between 82, 83, 84. And 
a gap in time to where things happened in his life uh, relating to the world that he was living in. And my mom was going in her own direction. And she doesn't want me to ever speak of the experiences between her and I, but that's tough. I've been abandoned a long time ago and have had to deal with the pressure of not even speaking about my own life. And I find it horrifying that the path that I'm on and things that I say have alienated me so much from my own family because ultimately certain people should be proud of me because I survived some really insane realities that they subjected me to. And in my opinion, I learned something positive from some of those experiences that have helped me, uh, I guess, understand things a little bit differently to have the experience of surviving certain things and moving around and being on your own and thrust out in the world. Those experiences need to be shared. Some of them are a little bit painful. Some people would rather I not share these things. But these experiences that I had early on in my life have been my greatest teachers. So in that period of 19... 19- 84, we were in Seattle, and at some point she got really involved in uh, the mainstream New Age movement. Maybe it seemed really independent at that time. We're talking about channeling, people talking about the coming uh, collective shift in consciousness, uh, not too different also from the Ashtar Command stuff, although there's a lot of stuff that doesn't go under that flag, but a lot of information that dealt with um, what I would say is a, is, is a part of a disinformation Archon campaign to convince people that certain things will happen by a certain point in time so they don't, in fact, do anything themselves. People have become very aware of this program that's out there by now, but I was living it in the 1980s. And so, from an early age, I was being indoctrinated with a certain belief system regarding the spirit world. And I would say that there were certain things that I was exposed to that may have been positive, and interesting, like going to a dowsing convention or, or visiting Mount Shasta. But what I will also say is we're also dealing with the same people that predicted that we would just be shifted out of all the negativity by the year 2000. And at that time, they were predicting the 80s, 87, and then it was 90s. So this is going way back before the harmonic convergence of 1987. And there is something about consciousness and planetary alignments and solar flares and other things affecting our consciousness. So I don't deny that there are things like vibration and vibrational frequency. I talk about stuff like this. Uh, but there's also uh, these, these paths that people have gone down, these collective paths, that at times can mirror a cult in the thinking process. And when you're a child and you're growing up around that, and someone is using that new age information as dogma as a way to control you, And I was told such things as, don't wear black, black is evil, and rock music. And it was almost like the hysteria of the Satanists in the 1980s. And there was a lot of control directed at me from my mother to, I don't know what she wanted to mold me to be. There was mixed messages throughout my life coming from here. At at an early age, she told me, it was almost like something out of Terminator, where Sean Connor is telling... Uh, her son, John Connor, that you need to prepare for the future because of the things that are about to take place. And there was some sort of reference to learning science and mathematics. These are what the Spirit said. Now, this mention of science and mathematics, there was actually a pressure consistently within my own... um, throughout my entire childhood with both my father and my mother to get good grades and to perform better at math. And I was one of those that did pretty poorly in school and relating to others, being an outsider, as a lot of you might assume. So there was a lot of tension constantly and punishment and resentment pointed my direction because of a failure to meet certain expectations relating to the world of academics. Now, I remember early on in elementary school, my grades were a lot better. And early on, I was going to school in Aurora. So after Seattle, we were back in Aurora. But there were a lot of road trips back and forth 
that I don't want to go on that I was basically forced to go on uh, to these new age retreats and whatnot up in Seattle, Washington, which is about a three and a half hour drive north. So I can recollect, I would say maybe 30 trips back and forth. And a lot of these trips, again, I, I didn't have the option of whether I want to go or not. And this was occurring at a time where, again, people were talking about aliens and UFOs and things landing and trying to connect with these beings and involving individuals that, that were claiming they were channeling these beings and people talking about the shift, the shift. And it almost became a joke that they literally would say, the shift, when is it going to happen soon, soon? And they would just echo that and smile like the golden Buddha. And it was kind of sick because the private world that I was living was living with basically and I feel like there's been psychological control throughout my whole life and I even talk about it coming from my mother. The amount of shrieking, there's a genetic thing I think with the females on the Nagel side where they flip the fuck out and just scream and just unleash a beast. Like their lives are just sheer terror, like, like they're almost suffering from mercury poisoning. Now, I don't know what's going on in that crazy gene on my mom's side of the family, but it's, it's there. And it was so extreme that my grandparents would watch my mom just scream and say, I'm correcting you. And th this is basically what marked the course of my childhood with my mother being screamed at for the smallest infraction that I was being corrected. And that word, you're being corrected, was literally said like a burn to me physically. And me rejecting that, she would use new age dogma to say the negative beings are channeling through me. So from a young age, my mother labeled me as being consumed with negativity. And needing to be corrected. Needing to be realigned needing to be screamed at, needing to be watched. And so there's so much this story, it's almost overwhelming to try to explain it to you. So it's going to be a little bit abstract. But there was a lot of control in what I was able to do as far as physically, how far I can go from the house. And I can only go so far before I was screamed back to the house. It wasn't as bad as the movie Psycho, but it paralleled it. There was a time when she tried to paddle me, and I fought back. We're going to talk more about my fighting back against uh, attempts to discipline me, especially including my own father later on in the podcast. And so I grew up fearing my mother, who throughout my childhood was saying, no, I'm your rescuer from your abusive Afghani father. And I learned to hate myself before 9-11, because I always knew I was different, and even kids in school always made a point to let me know that I was different. Of course, in my adulthood, I would say it took a turn, it's taken a turn for the, for the uh, obscenely insane, especially in my recent experience in Portland. And uh, regardless of what people think about that statement, or think about me, I am genetically different. And I am living in a particular society in a particular day and age with a particular amount of brainwashing taking place about a particular group on the planet that my father happens to come from. So I've had to live in this world since 9-11. But even going beyond and going earlier, back to where we are in the 1980s. So there was the shelter and security of the farm there was a stabilizing factor of uh, my grandfather who would take me on boat trips, uh, a few camping trips. There was a sense of jealousy that I was actually informed of on a, on a regular basis, in a sense, from both my mother and my uncle, that, that, my uncle spent, uh, that my grandfather spent way more time with me than he did with them. And in the way that it was mentioned a few times, it almost seemed to have a spirit of resentment there. And that psychology that they both hold 
two individuals that were given everything by my grandfather financially, till his dying days and beyond. We are talking about two individuals that have been rescued multiple times by their financially able father. He enabled the irresponsibility of both my uncles. There was an uncle... There is an uncle that I have. I never speak to him. He never speaks to me because, you know, of course, I am the son of my mother and they don't like each other. So uh, my grandfather being the good man that he was, he did not necessarily end up with children that are anywhere close to as moral and honorable as he was. So because he was so giving, when my uncle was in trouble with the law, pulled over for speeding, did too much cocaine in the 80s, needs a place to stay to rehab. He was given everything from my grandfather, and I haven't even got to the later stuff. This is just a caveat for later, but we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll we'll get to the ultimate bailout that my grandfather gave to my meth head uncle in the 2000s. The same uncle that never speaks to me to this day because, well, I'm the weird Alex Ansary who has dedicated his life to what he's doing. And so, with this story that I have, and this, uh, and this history, I, I feel a need to share it. And every now and then, I'll pause to collect myself. My mother was also bailed out, because her thing was to pursue, at one level, vacation trips to New Age retreats, gas money and everything required in that. She was also getting child support from my father, and I believe that most of that money was also pocketed. Opening up a conversation about the morality of uh, child support in today's day and age, when it's really being used by the mother to not work, to literally leech off of the male that provided her child. And there was a couple times in my, in my childhood that I began to go, wait a minute, my dad has to pay how many hundreds per month? How much of that am I seeing? Because we were basically living in a state of poverty despite the fact that we were living in my grandparents' home. At this point, my my grandparents were still together. They later were divorced. We'll approach that discussion later. So, in those periods of the mid-80s and the late 80s, there was a bright spot. And that bright spot in my childhood was the break from my mother. And even though I heard all these horrible things about my father, you know, and he tried for years to, he begged my mother, you know, he would cry, he would call drunk. It it was pathetic. My, My dad was pathetic, as pathetic as it gets. So he was scary and pathetic and kind of a slob. But he was able to function in this American society. He earned a master's degree eventually by the late 1980s. He was in school for well over a a decade, maybe 15 years. Of course, we're going to talk about my father, the sociopath, and how he also represents this archon mentality that science and and what is seen as higher education and rule and serving government and serving religious institutions this is the way to go it's serving the authority and so he has a certain mindset a certain sociopathic psychopathic mindset but he kept a lot of that under wraps in the best way that he could I know there was shit going on in his life, a lot of lonely nights, a lot of uh, failed relationships with American women. I think uh, the 1980s were very hard on him because the Russians invaded Afghanistan, and uh, I know that he was suffering from an alcohol problem at the time, but he also was living a decent life in the pre-9-11 era where the Afghans weren't seen as the enemy. The Afghans were our friends. Ronald Reagan said so. Hey, they're pushing out the Russians. The Russians invaded Afghanistan. There's a whole history behind that, and so people that were from that country that migrated to the United States, people like my father and his family, they lived through the 1980s already before the Taliban invaded Afghanistan with help from the ISI, controlled by the CIA. Before all that shit even happened, they were watching their country get invaded on TV from America, and they were freaking out because their, their family was back there. My dad's dad was still back there. 
<clears throat> what little I know about him is he may have been some general in the Afghan army at the time. There's pictures of him in like Western uniforms, Russian looking and everything. It's just like, but I've never been told the full story about him. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, because it's not so much the Afghan side, but the Ansari inside me speaking. Okay. On my father's side. And I don't even know how to begin to approach this, but it, it is a bloodline that goes back several thousand years, the Ansari bloodline. And the Ansaris were the, uh, the tribe of Medina that were Muhammad's bodyguards, so it's an Islamic last name. And it's been carried forth for thousands of years, uh, and it's now spread throughout the world. So there's Ansari with a Y, where there's Ansari with an I. There are other things I probably will reference later, but there's a famous Sufi ancestor called Khwaja Abdullah Ansari. You can find several of his books on Amazon. And if you've ever heard of Tamim Ansari, who's written several books about Afghanistan, that is my father's cousin. And speaking for, you know, in terms of one of the few Afghan writers in the United States, his mother is also white. His father is also uh, Afghani. Uh, he, he's never been able to connect with me or never really shown much interest in dialoguing about, say, the events of 9-11 and other things that have taken place in Afghanistan because Tamim Ansari is someone like my father, like other Ansaris that are in favor of Western involvement in Afghanistan because of what they believe. Because of the trauma they endured by watching Russia invade uh, the United States. See, these are people without an education that Zbigniew Brzezinski is an individual in the United States that baited Russia towards invading Afghanistan so Russia could be weakened. And I think that whole situation with the invasion of uh, Afghanistan, how it was really allowed to go on, as well as the current one by the United States, is something that historically Russia and the United States may have actually been on the same side the whole time. But I'm just speculating. But it's because of that that Cold War, Russia versus U.S., pick between the two superpower, um, psychotic mentality that has swept the world and is sweeping the world. This is why. This is why. The Ansaris and other Afghanis that have migrated to the United States, some of them openly support what's taking place to the point to where they are working alongside the military as translators. And to me, that is the equivalent of the Native American who helped the white man take out other Native American tribes. Because what is really taking place in Afghanistan is far beyond what most people are aware of or will admit. Especially when the truth of 9-11 is very different than the truth that people have been presented with. So, in the 1980s, my father was an escape from the uh, the abuse, the psychological abuse that was going on at home. And so it was at my father's house that I was able to watch R-rated movies and eat something as simple as pizza and soda. Not that that was banned at home, but I mean, that there was a sense of freedom being at the dad's place. And a lot of people can associate, you know, can, can have a little bit of empathy for that scenario. You know, uh, getting away from the controlling mother and visiting the, the single father. And this went on for several years. My mom placed strict, uh, strict control on, on being returned at uh, 6 o'clock on Sunday. Uh, my father was able to pick me up on, on Saturday at, at noon. So he'd have me for 24, uh, 32 hours or so. And throughout those years, there, there were camping trips. I met other Afghanis for the first time. Uh, people that were refugees that were living in Portland, later they may moved in droves to the Washington, D.C. area. But during those early years, I got to uh, meet my, you know, while I was a cute little kid and too young and cute to really be judged and thrown out by the answeries. <clears throat> you know, because when you're a cute little kid, everybody loves you. Oh, pitch your cheek, hey, answeries, John. How's your mother? How's your father? How's your grandfather? And I'll tell you why they always asked about my grandfather. You know, the fisherman, the carpenter, Nagel, Bill Nagel, Nagel floor covering. When Russia invaded Afghanistan, my mother begged my grandfather to help my father's family, some of his brothers, uh, some of his sisters, 
uh, and his mother. At, at one point, his mother got out. That may have been later. To, to put up some money so they can get out. And that's what he did. So it's because of my grandfather that some of these same people that don't see me as a worthy answer, because of the things that I say, and because of my conflict with my father, my, my wars with my father that have occurred verbally over the years, which we'll talk about, uh, I have been considered the bad son. I don't speak their language. They don't speak good English. But I'll tell you one thing, and we'll keep this short. I've never seen such pro-Americanism in my life now, we're not talking about the, the night. I'm going to have to you know, pause before going deep into this. But the version of Afghans that is given in the media is such a distorted one that most people, like, it's an exact thing, like, what? And it's no doubt provokes certain jokes and fear of being associated with me. And I think this is, this is a story that I've lived simply because of the bloodline in the background is the life that I've lived. And it's a story that I'm going to tell regardless of how it comes across, whether someone believes me or not, because the truth is the truth and my story is my story. And I won't be denied that. And what's happened. So in those years of the 1980s, <clears throat> I was still a kid. I was uh, still living with my mother. I was not involved in all this stuff. So the... The, uh, the major separation hadn't happened yet. Through those brief trips to visit my father, I would say things were pleasant enough. And the experiences of my father showing me around Portland in the 80s and seeing beautiful Portland in the 80s before it became super gentrified. He had an apartment on 23rd and Clinton for years. It's still there to this day. I'm sure that same apartment's probably going for 1500 a month. <clears throat> my father only paid 300 So I really got to see a good side of Portland uh, and ride my bike. And I had a friend named Vincent who was uh, born a day before me in a year, which we always found kind of strange. He was February 24th. I'm February 25th. Uh, him, 81, me, 80. Possibly same hospital as well. And I remember Rambo 3 came out. Rambo 3 depicted the, uh, the Russians occupying Afghanistan and Rambo's counter-assault representing the CIA uh, in that particular movie, the Rambo super soldier defending the Afghan villagers. And I remember that was emotional. You know, sitting there in my father's apartment, then watching that movie, not very many movies about Afghanistan, about where they come from. And I think they were a little disappointed in the movie, you know, maybe it, you know, making Rambo the sole hero. But, you know, it was uh, the violence depicted, very realistic. I think it was hard for them to watch. So as 89 turned to 90, as you guys know, the Russians pulled out of Afghanistan. Uh, we went into those magical 90s. I started becoming a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, still living back home with my mother. A lot of trips back and forth still. Now we're in the post-1987. We're in the new age. And so there was a lot of that stuff going on. Uh, I took an interest in um, a number of things. I'm trying to think of what pulled me in the most as a youngster. <clears throat> I know that my imagination uh, did go in different directions, and I would think about solar flares. I had dreams about solar flares. I've talked about that before. Uh, waking up in a reality where machines would be reading our thoughts and basically having this knowing that at one point in my life, uh, I would be living through such an event, surviving it. And so these are, these are early dreams and early thoughts that came to me. Uh, and, and some things were also maybe influenced from my mother dealing with the talks of earth changes or whatnot. But early on, I was starting to resist uh, the programming and the information. And I was starting to rebel in very subtle ways, incrementally, uh, throughout my childhood. But nothing major, no major crimes, no major uh, drug usages. Uh, just starting to rebel, argue back. And, uh, I, I was just, I was rejecting programming. So it created a, an adverse climate for a number of years. Uh, my mother had a series of significant boyfriends in her life that were, that were close to me at some point. 
one particular African-American gentleman, very large in fact, but very calm, very peaceful. Uh, he would also talk about channeling spirits. And he would also, um, there was some really good things that he had to say. There was also some very judgmental things that he had to say. And I would also consider mean. And he seemed to have some sort of influence over my mother for years, telling her what the spirits, what the spirits were saying to her, to him, to tell to her. And I think there was a lot of bullshit there. I think there was a lot of that dude's own agenda to get what he wanted. And maybe he believed some of the things that he was telling my mom. But, you know, we're dealing with some of the same people that give predictions for certain things to happen at a certain date that make certain claims that they're at a certain level in the spiritual astral plane. You know, the kind of people that constantly talk about themselves, that constantly belittle other people. And my mother shared the same type of uh, attitude with me uh, throughout my entire adulthood, including the current moment, which is why we rarely speak and probably will less and less after this. But of course, she doesn't even care what's on my YouTube channel because to her, nothing on this YouTube channel is of relevance to listen to. And I've had to deal with that throughout the entirety since I've been doing OTB TV, the YouTube channel, and everything else. So I was witnessing a master deceiver sitting at the park bench. So we would drive from Aurora to Portland, and this guy would just go on about, you know, you know, thousand feet of tidal waves taken out. And I think a lot of this stuff's possible. It was the misinformation about the timeline and making this all about him having the answers and talking to the spirits. And now that we know what we know about some of these mischievous spirits that have been giving people false information over the years, it's clear to me, at least in my eyes, that the world my mother introduced me to was not necessarily a world of love and light. It was a world that involves the archons, that are involved in fake uh, channeling, uh, the New Age movement, uh, false messages, lay your arms down, time to have a new DNA upgrade, control your ch children, tell them the color black is evil inherently, and create rules and structures so they can evolve their consciousness to go off planet in a rapture. So they can be the ones and not be left behind. I was basically sold the rapture with New Age packaging. With this type of Sean, uh, uh, Sarah Connor from Terminator type of aggressive, grab your head by the hair and say, do you realize what you're up against? But it was really, it was really about some sort of control to conform and be this perfect little man. And I think that it drove my mom to a sense of extreme frustration that I was not able to be molded into this child that she could fully love. And I think a lot of it also had to do that I was part my father. And there were things, there were even ways that we, my mom and I, would joke about my father's accent. And a few times she paused and realized what she was doing. She was brainwashing me to hate that part of myself, that Afghani self. And even as I've grown as an adult, there's never really been closure or anything with who I am and where I come from and what this means. Also the rarity of of two people coming together from those parts of the world and creating a child and then the divorce and then the family saying, told you so, told you, that's why we don't date outside our bloodline. That's why we don't date. And my dad got it from his family and my mom got it from her family. You date in Afghani, see what happened? <laughs> and some things weren't said, but they were felt. And my mom um, dealt with a certain sense of judgment for being with my father sexually and having me. There were even some, my, my uncle had some trashy friends uh, mentioning that he was a cokehead and a meth head. There was some years of sobriety, sobriety, but I think for the most part, even though he was a nice guy, uh, he's always kind of had that side of himself that destroyed himself and keeping certain friends around him. And there were certain comments made about my mother not being into white guys uh, because there was a series of boyfriends that she has had that were not what we would call completely white from black to Japanese to Afghanistan to Greek, Egyptian, and other. And that was really a insult to me personally. And so I grew up even before 9-11 with this stuff being told to me, being exposed to it. 
uh, being basically conditioned to be afraid of my father, and then also being conditioned through my mother's behavior to being afraid of my mother. My grandparents would watch this and the way she would scream and freak out and worry about what kind of adult I would turn out to be. Uh, it, it startled them and they would yell up the stairs to my mother who owned the castle upstairs that she needed to cool the fuck out. Now we're talking late 80s, early 90s. And the first time that I really dealt with my father's anger was in this time period of 91, 92. And my father was having a beer, like the alcoholic that he was. And you know, certain people from other countries, they can be really affectionate and, and want to kiss their child on the cheek. Not in a sexual way, but say, you know, here, let me kiss you. I'm your father. I'm your mama. I'm your aunt. Give me, give me, you know what I mean? And I pushed my father away. And I think I may have accidentally bumped his uh, face accidentally. And he looked at me like I just assaulted him. And then he proceeded to beat me with plastic coat hangers over the course of the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, this was not the first time in that year also that my, that my father tried to be violent with me. There was another time camping, and I think I blacked out some of those memories. But it, it dealt with conflict, being screamed at, and his demons um, kind of coming out at him in some sort of predatory way towards me. And... What I will say, what we'll, what I'll always remember is there's a series of abandonment issues with my mother that are pretty historic that she'll never recognize, of course. Uh, this was one of those moments. And I called home crying. And I don't, you know, all the fear she programmed me to distrust my father. All of a sudden, my father did something violent, but Alex must be to blame. And see, this type of new age... Uh, karma bullshit, psychology, uh, you know what, that happened to you because you brought it on yourself. She would say that. Carl channeling the demons, I mean the spirits, would say that. And when I became an adolescent, and you know kids sometimes, there's boys, uh, people get punched in the face, I was getting fucked with a lot. And I was a little guy and I looked different, so I was being taunted throughout periods of my childhood uh, to fight back, get suspended, and have my mother take the side of the school. And that conversation could go on and on and on for hours. And I intend to write a book to get really detailed into some of the things that I can still remember. And what it felt like to go to these schools that were starting to feel more like prisons. We'll get into high school later. But mind you, this is still the early 90s. I'm still in Aurora. I hadn't yet uh, began a long phase of moving that began the age of 13. But already before we're leaving the farm, I'm realizing that my mother isn't my protector. And I've now begun to fear my father. There was another time that I rode my bike too far away from the house. And we were going up Hawthorne. And I even rode my bike to Saturday Market. Uh, I wasn't supposed to do that, but I did it anyways. And my dad grabbed my ears on, bo on both sides, my left and my right. And grabbed as hard as he could, and he was shaking me like he would rip my ears off, my body. And this was being done in front of the neighborhood. Of course, my, my mother knew about these things. She just never held him accountable for it. And so, you know, there was, there was a, it, it, I was torn because I still saw my father as somewhat of a, uh, you know, my father's place is a place I can go to get away from my screaming mother. So in a way... My childhood is marked by, from early on, having the experience with both parents having their way with me. And even though, you know, nothing really worked out between them, they both had a general animosity for me. You know, I wasn't good enough. My grades weren't good enough. And so rules and regulations came into my life. And throughout that period, there were things introduced to my life and it was a reward punishment system. 
And all this revolved around whether I would talk back or not to my mother and whether or not my grades were good in school. And it was down to like a science, down to like almost like, okay, this digit means this and you lose this much time to watch TV or you lose this much in allowance. And what happened with the allowance thing was a mind fuck with money uh, that my mother was throwing at me to fuck with my head early on. Uh, because she didn't want to pay the allowance that you said, okay, you're reaching a certain age, you should have $10 a week. You know, something ridiculously like nothing. And then she would just take it away. And we would have these things where you talk back one more time, I'm going to take off, go ahead and take it off. All right, I'm taking off two, go ahead and take three. Okay, and I'm going to take off three. Go ahead and take off, take off 10. And it was a psychic war. <laughs> so there was a light that came in um in November 92 and she started seeing the uh the other significant boyfriend again and it was her period of a couple years uh, up until uh, 94 95 But I really don't want to talk a lot about this person because it's not really right. But I would say this person was one of the most dangerous men I had ever met in my life, physically. Uh, he had worked for, uh, for the mob at one point in the, the 1970s in Portland. And throughout my childhood, he, he told me a lot about his life and the things that he did and the things that he did to other people and what he went to prison for in 1986, 1987, uh, when he torched a couple crack houses owned by some Crips, the rolling sixties that came up from LA at that time. He was, he was of Asian, Asian descent, knee deep in the underworld in collecting in, uh, in loan sharking in street fighting. And he grew up, fighting and being in very dangerous situations in, in everybody was Kung Fu fighting. I mean, he was an old uh, wise guy of sorts in a white man's world, uh, that worked with a number of individuals in the underworld at that time in Portland. And that was a time of great transition, not only for the world, but in, in, in power structures and groups and who was involved in what. So throughout my childhood, this guy taught me how to box. And he taught me how to uh, throw a punch, uh, taught me a little circular motion that comes from Aikido. And really, he, uh, what I would say is he, he awakened a spirit inside me that's been training, I would say, for multiple lifetimes in certain arts. And this person has never taken me all the way. We, we really have uh, faded in and out of each other's lives off and on. I would say mostly him fading out of my life more and more completely in recent years because of the path that I've taken. Uh, but this person was, a was, a a role model in my life that for the first time outside of like MacGyver on TV or Rocky or Bruce Lee, uh, other role models of mine. I also like the Kung Fu, the legend continues because see in 92, I started practicing with nunchucks. I started doing Taekwondo. I started doing a form called uh Tom Pai Kung Fu in Longview uh, during the later period where I had to move. Uh, and I also took wrestling in high school. And plus with uh, this individual teaching me uh, how to step into a punch and work it on the same punch, uh, as he would say, master the same techniques, don't try to learn a bunch. It opened up an outlet for myself. And as I grew older, I've been exploring the martial arts side of myself. So this whole thing with this individual is interesting because through him, I learned a lot about the underworld, the world of organized crime, uh, the world of government corruption a little bit, but mostly organized crime. He also many books, every book you can uh, imagine dealing with the families in New York. He was also a, a big reader. He also himself had a master's degree. He also was a comic book artist uh, as well as a bodybuilder to go with the martial arts background. And later on in life, he got involved in hotel management, believe it or not, and uh, other things relating to bread and circus uh, outside of the, the world that he was involved in in the 70s and 80s. But uh, this individual had a lot of charisma. He had a lot of experiences. 
And at one point, he really had a glow to where he was rubbing elbows with a lot of celebrities. And he was also kind of a shit talker. But there was also a lot of legitimate things to his life experience. And so what I learned from this man is that some men can be really capable, like a real-life superhero. And to me, he really was a real-life superhero. And, you know, there was a period where he was running um, a place called Flirts in the 90s at the Holiday Inn. And there were uh, uh, several times where lots of gang members were in there. And he went from bouncer, of course, to managing the bouncers, something like, uh, you know, something you'd see Patrick Swayze in Roadhouse, where he literally works his way up where he's controlling the whole show. This is after, of course, the torture of the crack houses and, and going to the penitentiary. You know, when he gets out of the penitentiary in the late 80s, Portland's a violent place. And he's not exactly... Um, able to live the same world that he used to because of his reputation, because of what went down, uh, because of probation. So he became incrementally more involved in, you know, uh, I guess mainstream stuff, but still, you know, being in environments where he is the, the person everybody's looking to, to control the situation, like the only guy that can deal with a crowd of 20 or 30. And there's a lot of things that he's been through that I'd say he tried to impart to me. But I think that this person was in my life to teach me certain things relating to self-defense, but also relating to people, uh, understanding the world, how certain things operate. And there became a point in my life to where we drifted apart more and more. And I'm going to come back to that. But this person coming into my life in the early 90s was like a spark of energy that gave me something to ground my energy into or direct my energy into, and that was the fighting arts. And so I would train in basic things, and there was a, a major transition taking place at that time with having to move from the farm. <clears throat> my grandparents were getting a divorce. I watched them fight off and on, and my grandmother shrieked to my grandfather to get out, get out. And so I was exposed to a lot of that domestic um, screaming and demands to get out. And eventually my grandfather did that. He did just that. He, he got out. He moved in with a lady that he was secretly seen, who I've never really been close to, and I don't think she's ever really seen me like family, but... What did happen was my grandfather started to explore his other family, which was her family, and getting involved with her kids, and uh, her kids working for his business. And so my grandfather really was dealing with a little bit of disappointment from his failed relationship with my mother and the two uncles. All spoiled brats, all helped generously financially throughout the entirety of their lives. He began to be discontent and spend more time with them. And to them, myself, um, my uncle, my mother, we were never really a part of their family. So in 92, I'm 12. I'm practicing the martial arts. I'm reading lots of books. I also read a lot of books. I mean, during the early years of my life, I got great scores and ratings and awards even. One was actually signed by the governor. Oh, your summer reading list. Yes, my mother with all these summer reading lists at me. Uh, so th there really was somewhat of a stability for years living there on the farm. And I learned how to survive, I guess, psychologically dealing with my mother. Uh, but things took an interesting turn in late 93 and the farm was sold after about a year of it being seen. You know, the realtor would come in and show people. Sad thing for the realtor, you know, even though he showed like 10 people the house. And I remember being there, Alex, clean up your room. The people are coming to see the house, I'd be told. That dude didn't even get to sell the house. Some other lady walked in and sold it right from under him. Uh, property got sold for $450,000. Uh, a property that is worth more than that. I think they were talked down a, a little bit from that initial price. So in 1993, I am migrating up to Portland to live officially. And I'm going from the school that I've always been going to. I've never really had a lot of friends, but I never really had major problems with people. I wasn't necessarily the new kid in town. So I went from a school I was familiar with to being thrust into this place called Jackson Middle School. 
in southwest Portland, Oregon. Kind of a, a hiring area, a lot of yuppies, a lot of preppies. I'm an outsider coming in. I'm 14 years old at the time. Uh, I have now progressed to Taekwondo. And so I'm mostly doing a lot of high kicks and things of that nature. And this is before I really got more effective in my hands. And I'm much more effective in my hands than my feet. But at that time, it was the reverse to where I was kicking above the head. And so I was uh, somewhat of a hot shot and I didn't want to let people push me around and I was all prepared to deal with the new kids. So there were a number of fights here and there. And I do remember feeling excited to be in Portland to be able to go to McDonald's or to be able to go somewhere and have somewhat of a, a curfew that my mother gave me up until four o'clock. Like, you know, I could be out till four it was ridiculous stuff like that, or out till five, so I'd be at the library playing poker with my Vietnamese friend, uh, Nguyen, or Nugent, Mike Nugent, or some people say it's pronounced Nguyen, <clears throat> and at the same time, even though, you know, she's incrementally, she's seeing the other guy on and off, uh, he's also picking me up once in a while to take me out to eat, he would go out for Chinese dinner, uh, he would go over maybe a boxing lesson or he teach me how to block, you know, certain drills, like just block the same punch and he had lightning speed. And so I had some pretty good exercises with him at the age of 14. And I wish we can go back and do that again, like the old days. Uh, so that was a time of me focusing solely on, uh, dealing with the aggressive world at large that I was coming into and hearing about fights in schools and stabbings. And, and the, the 90s were a, a really violent time. So as a young kid coming up and seeing the L.A. riots on TV, I was dedicating my life to being basically my own Bruce Lee. And so I would go through as many techniques as possible, try to train in different schools. And th this is the period that I'm going from um, Jackson Middle School to high school. And in this time period, getting back to my mom and, and the, um, the tensions between us. Now, my grandfather's helping out with the rent as my mom goes back to school and she's pursuing ballet again, which she was very successful at. She went to some Royal Academy in the 70s in Canada. And I feel, uh, you know, she regretted not getting back to it when she was younger. And what interrupted that was, was me. I was born. So I basically interrupted her, uh, her life dream to be a recognized ballerina with the ego fulfilled in everything that comes from other people. So she began to depart on this path, mixing it with, you know, so she would dance and listen to Crockett's theme from, you know, Miami Vice and everything was she, she, foo, foo, new age. And it was actually very disgusting because she was a maniac when she would scream at me. So she was anything but spiritual, but somehow trying to bring forth this whole thing that she's still a pretty goddess that deserves attention or something really completely devoid of genuine spiritual care for your child. Because the resentment between us just kept growing and growing and growing. And I was starting to act out, skip school, and get involved in shoplifting. And so what happened was, in this grand uh, climax, if you will, I was kicked out on my 14th birthday. And thus, that began the extension of the abandonment experience between myself and my mother. Was the fact that it happened on my birthday. And it is true that I skipped school for a week, but it's also true that that was actually very therapeutic for me because that was the period in which I was dealing with people uh, uh, insulting me, assaulting me. And so I'm getting into a straight fighting uh, mentality. Uh, I'm looking for brass knuckles. Uh, I'm taking cues from my friend who, you know, who's been involved in the crime world and I'm, I'm collecting things like batons. Uh, one day I even brought nunchucks to school. Like, you know, I'm, I'm developing a mentality of... Uh, beating the you-know-what out of someone. The truth is, I never did that. Uh, I, I was protected from a lot of things. I've dealt with a few scuffles, been punched in the face a few times, fought back, but never really uh, got ravaged by the hyenas of this world. I was real lucky. But at that time, that was my mindset. Get prepared, defend yourself, box, and train. And to a point, it was an obsession. I was training four hours a day. Okay, so this is in my early years, childhood, going over the right punch, going over the hook, Forward kick, round kick, side kick, axe kick, crescent kick, spinning back kick, spinning heel kick. Remember one time this this kid tried pushing me around. I'm I, I'm taking time. I'm not even thinking about what I'm doing. I do a spinning heel kick. I literally watch his like lips go, 
And I was like, whoa. And he's like, whoa. I'm like, damn. So basically, <laughs> I, I went through a couple light punishments, but I came across some psycho kids. I'm not even going to bother with those stories. I came across some psycho kids that made me go, whoa, Nelly. I better keep training and developing this master killer punch because it's a jungle out there. On my 14th birthday, I was uh, told to pack my things. And my mom took me up to uh, Longview, Washington. And I live with my grandmother, who is grieving from the uh, divorce from my grandfather. So she was going through a lot of pain. And she was doing a lot of shit talking about my grandfather, who was the most stabilizing uh, male figure in my life, next to the uh, the man of Asian descent that I also uh, talked about. Those main two are some of the most instrumental forces in my life and my early development for the positive. <coughs> and so I'm in a new school. And, you know, I remember being on the field, someone messing with me, boom, I shin kick him right in the kneecap. And then he's pausing, thinking about whether he wants to actually proceed with that one. Uh, I started taking harongdo, which is a, a Korean form of martial art. At one point, the royalty were uh, in, in Korea, I suppose, were taking harongdo. And the guy that taught it was a psycho. The guy that taught it was, was a friggin' archon possessed psycho that, that really wanted to be bowed every time, like, you were there, like, you go to bow your sensei. You know what was weird? He was a fucking teacher at the high school. So when he would come into science class, I, I, I'm like, I'm not going to get up and bow to you. And he looked at me funny. Do you know how weird that would be if I was to get up and bow to this? I'm a new kid in school. I ain't bowing to you in the classroom. Maybe he even expect me to. But <laughs> So, you know, I'm doing also late night at the YMCA, and there's always wannabe gangbangers uh, at this uh, late night. They, you know, they, they'd open it up. Kids would play basketball, sexual tensions amongst teenagers. Uh, you know, people talking about fights. Ooh, what gang you with? You know, some blonde girl. She's talking about being a crip. And I'm just watching this, and, and Snoop Dogg is on TV, and, and vehicles are pop, boom, 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 Snoop Dogg and Juice, I can't even fuck, gin and juice, oh, look, I got a bunch of condoms, I'm gonna fuck a bunch of chicks, and I'm watching this on TV, and I'm watching these fuckers out here, and I'm going, holy shit, these motherfuckers are zombies, these motherfuckers want to be gangsters, what the fuck, and then all these, see, see my, my friend, and that taught me some of these things, worked in some of the roughest nightclubs and dealt with some of this shit and was involved in the underworld in the 70s, 80s, where things were more violent. And so when he was working at the club and whatnot, I was hearing about the shit that he was dealing with, full on mobs. And I'm an up and coming teenager, 14, 15, and I'm already up in Longview, Washington. It alarmed me. <laughs> Just seeing society go in that direction and seeing how people can mimic pop culture and what's on TV. <clears throat> now, I, I was a pretty uh, emotional kid then. And my grandmother and I didn't completely get along, but I miss my grandmother. And I wish that <clears throat> we got along a little bit better during that time period, but it was a hard time period for both of us. But she also provided me a, a place of shelter and, and comfort for a time being. Where, you know, I heard her listening to Coast to Coast AM. And that was my, my, my grandmother throughout the years exposed me to talk radio. She would listen to Rush Limbaugh, but she hated him because she's a Democrat. But she's one of those that would listen anyways. And she got into listening to Art Bell. And even though she wasn't into the New Age stuff, Art Bell's delivery was something that pulled her in. And it would pull me in. And as a little kid, I would interview my grandmother. And I got tapes somewhere. That was the other thing I did as a kid. I would play radio DJ once in a while. And I would interview people, interview my mother, interview my uncle's girlfriend. I interviewed my grandmother. And I would just try to, to simulate a talk show. <laughs> During one of my mother's punishments, she told my dad, Alex can't watch TV. You know what I did? Back in the day, you know, you had two decks on the recorders. Yeah, you, you had two cassette recorders, right? So you can dub. One plays, one records. And this is back in the day where some of these stereo systems cost thousands of dollars. And I learned how to dub. And while I've never used subliminals, I actually found the subject interesting and figured out how to, you know, make a little subliminal tape. And the whole thing was like the buzz about subliminals. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And maybe you can do it, you know, a positive affirmation, create your own tape. So I got really interested in dubbing. 
and create little videos on VHS, little kung fu fight scenes, you know, the best of Bolo Young from one VHS to another. So in my early, early days, I would play DJ and do a little bit of analog editing without really knowing that it would play a big role in my life later on. Uh, so the living experience with my grandmother came to a close, and I visited, stayed with my grandfather for a month, met some girl at the fair. remember trying to have one of my first sexual experiences, taking the bus up to her place in Vancouver, and her not really being into it, and me just going, okay, and taking the bus back home to Canby, like three hours away. And I was preparing myself for what was to follow. The announcement came from my mother that she was moving to New York City, specifically to Queens, New York, to live with her Egyptian boyfriend that she met in New York City. She moved to New York City, visited a few times, wanted to be a ballerina, figured that she would be more successful as a shorter aging ballerina in New York uh, than she would be in Oregon. She thought she would be happier in that experience. And so that's why, you know, basically she left her child behind or at first brought me to New York because I was all about a new experience. <sighs> uh, my stuff got shipped there from uh, Amtrak, like in boxes. And as soon as I arrive in New York, you know, not to mention the shock of being in New York and being on the freeway for the first time and seeing her ungodly, uh, disgusting-looking uh, boyfriend. She went through all my stuff and took out the self-defense weapons that I prepared. My <laughs> I got myself uh, some lead, still nux, uh, spring baton, and uh, I also had some uh, pornography magazines, and uh, I had a, a, a comedy, an X-rated comedy phone prank where instead of it being phone sex some girl would get some guy on the line and then she'd say something really crazy dealing with <laughs> something out of the wall that would make him realize he was being pranked she confiscated all that stuff and took it from me and immediately I was being thrust into a New York City public school and because we were just outside of the zone of the school 10 blocks away I had to go to the Jamaican neighborhood in New York mostly black and probably not very safe, and had to go through metal detectors, and it was a big shock to go from uh, Wilson High School to the high school in um, Longview, Washington, where I live with my grandmother, to now being put into a new school system where I have to go through metal detectors, where a pissed off black lady behind me is saying, walk faster, walk faster. To where, you know, I'm generally concerned, like, what is this place where I have to go through a metal detector? And then basically take the bus for an hour and a half back home. And see, this is the thing. All that control was there early on, me biking around the same countryside she grew up in. And then all of a sudden, it's okay to take me to New York and put me on a bus and confiscate my ability to defend myself. Uh, thinking that I have no common sense, that I have no right to have a way or means to defend myself. This also says something about our culture today. Well, she started yelling at me in the living room, asking me if, you know, I, I've done my homework, and it was a lot of control stuff, like back home, and it was like the first couple days of school, and there weren't any assignments yet. But I was already being accused of being deceptive. And I called her the B word and her boyfriend grabbed me and threw me against the wall. First time I almost pissed my pants, just a trickle went down, but not the full, uh, not the full jar. My, uh, father at this time had also left. This is what's eerie. He also moved from Portland within a few years of my mother or a year from Portland he went to the uh, the Fairfax, Virginia area, just outside of Washington, D.C. And this is the area where there's a high concentration of my family members. Uh, not only people from Afghanistan or Ansaris, other bloodlines, people from other parts of the Middle East. There's a massive concentration of them, and in Portland there's, there's very few. So I was very, I wasn't connected to any family in Portland because they all went to the East Coast for the most part. So they're, they're, like, a, they're like a clan. And a lot of them they are kind of um, 
<coughs> subservient, the answerees, that is, to my father. Uh, you're telling the brothers, the sisters, uh, because in the Afghan culture, the oldest living male is pretty much the decider. Think George Bush, I am the decider. And in the culture, the oldest male. When the, the father of all the children is passed on, the oldest brother uh, is, is in a, is in a f- place of influence. So my father uh, baited me out to Fairfax. This is before the conflict with, with my mom's boyfriend at the time. And he wanted to make it seem like Disneyland. I was taken to the Centerville Mall. I, I saw my, my cousins, my female cousins, other family members. People try to treat me really well. And this whole thing was like, hey, Alex, we, we know the situation. You're in New York now with your mom's boyfriend. Do you want to live with me? Do you want to live with your father? And it came down to me saying yes when that guy threw me against the wall. And in September of 1995, I am now uh, getting all my stuff boxed up and being shipped from Amtrak to live with my father in uh, just outside the Washington, D.C. area. Now, the next calendar year, between September 1995... in the summer of 96, that's a period of, uh, a lot of, uh, the, the, I, I lived with my dad for, I'd say a period of three years from 95 to 98. When I moved out, I moved out in Portland and that started a major significant, uh, phase of my life. But back in 95, we're still in Fairfax and I'm living with him and his brother and his brother's wife for the first time. While I did not see, uh, you know, terrorist talk or anything like that in general, I was in an environment where I was being controlled, how much I was doing my homework, whether or not I was trying hard enough at my grades. And there were other family members involved in watching me. Um, there was, there was a time where I bought a, a black guy home. And that freaked out uh, the uh, the mother of the the wife of his brother, and there was a scolding for that. There was a lot of talk about living in the grid and the cost of living in the grid. Uh, my uncle put some sort of a lock on the thermostat. It was so cold uh, that when we turned up the thermostat, it was so expensive that when the bill came in, there were major problems. So there was tension, scarcity. Of course, we're right outside the Washington, D.C. area. At an early time in my life and age, I sensed the evil in Washington, D.C., although I couldn't put my finger at it. On it, it was just like the Matrix. All these people working for the machine, uh, worshiping the government, worshiping education, uh, worshiping control, controlling their children, uh, punishment, harsh punishment, screaming, things being thrown. And so my first experience was feeling like not only was I not reaching the expectations on an academic level? Uh, I was not a Muslim. I was exploring meditation and Buddhist thought and early, early thoughts. I was also trained a lot in the martial arts. And at one point I had my own punching bag. And at one point I had it hung in the basement and it became um, a sense of animosity between my father and I. There is uh, a number of things I want to share relating to the specific timeline of now going to a new high school this time in, I believe this was uh, Springfield, Virginia. And this is uh, a time of feeling very disconnected from other people. And there's a lot of ethnic kids in the school, but everybody is like in this weird mind control mentality. And on the school bus, there was a real lack of connection to other people. Uh, And I had for the first time a friend from Afghanistan. He was a full-blood Afghani. And what me and him would do is practice Jeet Kune Do. He was also very inspired by Bruce Lee's Fighting Methods series. And there was another Afghani that happened to teach Jeet Kune Do. (laughs) So we trained a couple times. And me and my friend Amid uh, sparred a couple times. And Amid's friend... Uh, later on at one point, uh, took us to uh, Washington, D.C., <laughs> actually saw a street fight in Georgetown. So I got to see early on 
that that place was a wild place that I only want so much to deal with. But I did a little bit of exploring. And like I said, I had a few interesting friends, not a lot of friends. Uh, there was another guy, that's, uh, a white guy named Steve, that later was my friend. Uh, when we moved out of my uh, my dad's brother's home, <clears throat> and we moved into a different home with a different roommate. So there was a sense of alienation between myself and the Afghani family. And I think they saw me as too American. I think they saw me as brainwashed by my mother. I know that my father would say things like this. And I know that they kind of probably viewed my mother in a certain light. I don't believe that my father knows the extent of abuse that he inflicted on either myself or my mother. And so they were apologists. And so they would ask how my mother's doing, but with a sense of judgment. Even though my grandfather paid for some of them to get outside of Afghanistan, I don't see them showing gratitude today. I don't see that. And I find that to be incredibly tragic. So we grew distant. And there was resentment. And a reputation began about me as a uh, not a follower of Allah. And not a good student. And so things were complicated. Eventually, my father and his brother were fighting. And so my, my dad found, uh, found us a new place to live. And I'm going to a new school, School 4000, where they have the middle school and high school together. So when the bell rings, it is literally a gang of sheep. And all throughout my high school, I've been, I've been forced, my high school exp- experiences, forced to see assemblies. And I was always very much thrown off by the energies of assemblies like the Roman like the, the, the beating of the drums, the intensity, the intense sexuality, the looking at the uh, the cheerleaders, panties you can look but you can't touch putting it out into our face early on through the type of circus that they create through the cheerleader uh, football player worship ceremonies. I saw this at every school I went to except the New York ones and the one in Longview but Wilson uh, in Portland, all about that, and the jocks and the yuppies and the croquet players, or um, uh, excuse me, lacrosse. <laughs> What's the difference, right? And I saw a lot of that in Virginia. So the fighting between my father and I took interesting turns, dealing with his anger, relating to grades. And there was one time in which I just got out of the car and started walking away as if I would run away. Because at that time period, I wanted to run away from my father because I was terrified. And one of the things that he did at the age of 16 to me, there were were several things. Uh, He recreated what his father did to him. Uh, Now, back in the old country, back in Afghanistan, my father's father, uh, I don't know how bad he beat him up, but my dad did something like destroy the living room or cut a couch in half. And his dad beat him up, smacked him around, and dropped him off at the police station in Kabul, Afghanistan. So that was a traumatizing moment for my father. And about a year later, he was out of Afghanistan on his way to America. You know, where he later got really into Pink Floyd and Fleetwood Mac and Bob Dylan and a lot of, you know, in a time and period where he was a lot more welcome in the society than he would be today. Uh, You know, if, if he was coming over here and trying to assimilate. And you know this is the truth. So in a way, my dad came in during good times. And so did the other Afghans. Uh, they got to experience that before you know things got crazy with uh, the staged event known as 9-11. Now, we're in Burke, Springfield. I'm at a new school. And there's a couple of, of significant clashes between my father and I. He recreated the, uh, the, the dumping off scenario. He took me to juvenile hall. And he asked uh, juvenile detention hall if they would just take me away. And the reason for this was the grades in school, they interviewed me and I told them the situation, told them I was scared and I I never saw them again. I was basically sent back and my father never said a thing. Uh, As far as counselors and things of that nature, what I didn't mention back with my mother is that I was assigned to see a child counselor who was paid a hefty amount because there was insurance for these counseling sessions. And all this was about me obeying my mother, allowing her to correct me, and getting a certain satisfactory uh, grade level. And it's simply because I didn't perform or conform 
to the demands of the public educational school system that I was basically being labeled as crazy. And so while no drugs were prescribed, <coughs> the counseling sessions were. And at the conclusion of the counseling sessions, uh, it was also uh, demanded by my mother that I keep going even when I was living with my grandmother. I was told at the conclusion of several years, I don't know who chose to bring it to a close, whether it was the insurance or the counselor. The counselor said, you know, Alex, I don't think there's anything wrong with you. Now, you, you know, you would think that some of these counselors would rat you out uh, if you were to pull out a knife or show them a cool toy. But at that time, I was carrying around a spring baton. And in many of these sessions where I would just vent about just both my grandmother and my mother just going nuts on me, he would just listen and talk and let me share. And I actually showed him at one point my spring baton. I still have a spring baton to this day, not the same one, still train with one. Uh, he could have ratted me out and he could have called the police. He may, for all I know, thought it was cool and practical. I, at the age of 14, had on my hands a particular baton that actually requires a little know-how to actually use and strike. Otherwise, you can have it easily taken away from you. Even had a concern for that, the guy didn't even say a thing. He told me at the end of these counseling sessions, Alex, I don't think anything is wrong with you. Um, he didn't really go on the blame game, but he showed a certain sense of empathy and a certain sense of concern. This is before I left my grandmother's and I'm on my way back to New York or to New York. A sense of concern for what I would end up in being back with my mother. Okay, so let's go back to my father. In addition to trying to drop me off at juvie, on my 16th birthday, he dropped me off at a halfway house. <laughs> and at that time, I had a number of Bruce Lee posters in the house, in my bedroom. And he informed me on my birthday that he ripped up all the Bruce Lee posters. And he just wanted to let me know. So I'm 16 years old. Uh, I'm still a virgin. I'm in a halfway house with a really hot chick on the female side, really wishing to <laughs> maybe have that type of a chance. And so there was, there was this halfway house with like men and women and we got to know each other and we're all from like fucked up families. And sometimes people went back to their families. Sometimes they went to foster care. I was praying for foster care. I wanted to get away from my father's abuse. There is one last specific story I'll tell about this time period. I was training with my uh, punching bag downstairs in the basement as the second place we were staying in Virginia. And he basically came down and he went on one of his rants. Anybody can be Rambo. It takes a real man to be an intellect. And he, he was basically right up in my face demanding that I go up to my room and do my homework, you know. And... Uh, I do remember going up and I remember, you know, this is a time period where I'm also trying to start meditating to deal with the sense of uh, abandonment from my mother. Uh, I, I'm missing my friend back home, the guy that used to train me, and I'm, I'm in some pretty adverse climates. And I'm right outside D.C., folks. Uh, but I, I, despite my attempts to just meditate and just, uh, I just, I, I was so filled with rebellion. And I went downstairs, and, and he is drinking again. And I hold the baseball bat up above his head and said, Motherfucker, don't you ever fuck with me again, because I will fuck you up. Okay, long story short, calls the police. Police come by, they, they see that he is uh, drunk. And they leave. So these are the beginnings of the conflicts between my father and I. And they were building and building and building. But both him and I, at that time, and it was a different time in Portland, we both missed Portland. And so, even though my dad got a job, he had worked off and on in government social services, helping people find jobs, disabilities in the 80s in Portland, and found other related jobs in counties in Virginia relating to uh, admi administrative uh, uh, uh work, th things of that nature. And so it was basically held over my head that he had left the government job to bring me back to Portland where we would be happy. But it wasn't really just my decision. It was his as well. It was agreed 
that this would be the best thing. And so <clears throat> I go back to my grandfather's and stay with him for a period of time. And that was a period of time in which he was building a new home for his new wife. And that was uh, a, a time of staying in the garage, staying in the guest house, uh, basically being rescued by my grandfather again, something that would be echoed in the year to follow. Things get weird. Okay, so now we don't go to a neighborhood in Portland where there's fun stuff going on, in my opinion. You know, I'm 16 years old now. I want to be in Southeast Portland. We go back to Yuppieville. We go back to the West Side, and I'm back at William Wilson High School. And I've seen those same kids that I used to get in fights with. And then now I'm starting to get entangled with other stuff. The very different uh, part of this story is that I started to find my own freedom. And I encountered some mistakes along the way in uh, a period of time that I'll talk about probably in the next podcast because this has gone on for a while. We're going to... Uh, we're going to conclude this podcast around the 1998 period. But uh, in 96, I'm back. And by the way, my first job was while I was still in uh, Burke, Virginia. And I worked at Taco Bell six hours a night, Friday and Saturday, no break. It was one of the few jobs I had where they just didn't believe in giving someone a break. And I thought that was kind of strange being pretty close to D.C., <laughs> my second job was Wendy's. So as soon as we're, we're on Barber Boulevard, not too far from the, uh, the Chevron, not too far from the Safeway, not too far from the 7-Eleven. And we're in um, uh, one of those Barber Court uh, apartment complexes, uh, Apartment 6. There's a couple that used to fight, a white and black couple. And she used to assault him, and there was a lot of yelling and banging. So there, were, there was violent combat going on above an apartment where my father and I would... Uh, start to have physical confrontation on on a level relating mostly to pushing on my father's part and attempted choking. Uh, so I started working to escape the abusive environment. I was thrust back in the public educational school system and, you know, operating on an average level, some B's, some C's, you know, of course, algebra, your typical creative writing, writing 101, uh, maybe basic marketing class. Um, high school is not an easy time to be alive, uh, especially when you're when you're going through hormones and you're dealing with um, uh, combative people and you're in classrooms with really sexy women, well, young girls, and you're their age and you don't feel like you have something to offer them or you're in a society where there's a sense of even early on distrust. Uh, things were not easy in high school at that time period. Things were not happy. The, the kids at that school were really fucked up, actually. Quite a bit of them smoked and were kind of doing the goth thing. It was, it was difficult to actually be around other kids that were really depressed and sad uh, because there was a sense that some of these people hated me and hated other people, and they kind of wore that with their makeup and their look. I, I know a lot of you have dealt with that crowd as well. But it's not a very friendly experience. And I don't think that's a very spiritual place either, that part of Portland. I think that a lot of those kids have come from a lot of troubled homes, even the so-called more affluent areas. So it was a young kid being back in that environment, which I didn't want to be back in. It, it affected me. And in the way that I dealt with it, I skipped school where I could, but I didn't go over the top. Uh, I kept training where I could, how I could. Uh, got a heavy bag uh, actually mounted in my uh, bedroom at the time in the apartment I shared with my father. Uh, went from working at Wendy's to working at Safeway for six months to working at Fred Meyer. And working at Fred Meyer full-time, counting bottles full-time, and saving up $2,000 by May of 1998, uh, with the help of my grandfather, I got my first apartment. This was following several physical confrontations with my father. Uh, one of them involved, um, you know, him trying to choke me and then me demonstrating for the first time to my father that I had become physically stronger than him. Not very hard to foresee. You have fat slob, you have young teenage athlete, martial artist, uh, with probably some strong genetics from the mother, from the Austrian Germanic side. So I was someone that was frightening now to my father because I basically took his hand uh, that was on my throat and basically pried it down slowly 
you know, and like two sheep locking heads, me pushing him back, and you know, with this whole threat about calling the cops because he developed this habit of calling the cops on me. Took his hand, put it on my shirt, then ripped my shirt. Said, go ahead and call the cops. That's domestic violence. <laughs> so this kind of stuff went on another time. He played the same game of getting up in my face. And I think he was on tequila that night. And I shoved him back with like one hand. And I'll always remember this moment. There aren't very many moments where I've shoved a man back and he almost went flying up in the air backwards. But something cosmic happened that moment where I, where I palm hand pushed my father back. And he fell back on his ass. Just completely frapped. So you added all these other situations plus one final caveat. I drink my first beer. I drink a Boone's. I'm 18 years old. I'm in the house. And um, 18, 17, also smoking a little weed for the first time. <clears throat> he locks the doors on me. And this is a period where I'm starting to rebel. And I'm not taking it. And I, I step back. And I kick the door in. I kick the metal door in. And I think that freaked him out as well. Uh, long story short, he, he went to a foreign country, went to Pakistan, and with the help of family, he, uh, you know, he was tired of being alone in his failed relationships with American white women, and I think a lot of that had to do with his personality, but, you know, perhaps other things is his background, but definitely his personality. So he decided to go back to the old country and get himself a wife, and he was back, uh, with her trying to think of exactly the season, but it was the 97, 98 time period. And that was the period where she came in and there was still conflict between us. Uh, but things got to the point where it was May, 1998. And I conspired with my, um, with my grandfather. At the same time, I just stopped going to school. Uh, you know, so I, I could have finished with a couple credits. And at the very end, after a lifetime of bullshit relating to school, I quit going to school with a couple credits left. And in May of 1998, I was in my first apartment on the corner of 37th and Cora. And not too long after that, I'm working at Fred Meyer full time. I'm taking the bus, two buses to get home, dealing with the bus mall and all that crap that you deal with downtown when you're dealing with the grid and, and, and people in downtown, especially downtown Portland. So I'm dealing with some nitty gritty energies uh, drinking for the first time, uh, to cope with some of those feelings of being young, you know, not having a girlfriend, but having a buddy, you know, and ha I had a fake ID. So I was the dude that can get us stuff. And I never really was much of a drinker or a smoker, always kind of preferred pot, but this was a period where me and a particular friend of mine, and we would do martial arts together, um, off and on throughout high school and hang out together. We had different personalities, but also very similar. And we became best friends. And he also was working at Fred Meyer with me. So this is a guy that I ran around with that was kind of the person that I confided um, stuff to and hung out with. And on a few nights, a few summer nights, we actually went out one night looking for trouble, looking for a brawl. And I don't, I don't, I don't have a history of doing that. <laughs> so me and this troublemaker, who is really a good friend to a certain degree, and he's doing great today, but... uh during this period of, of 1990, or, yeah, 1998, um, me and him are hanging out more and more in the apartment. And it was in that apartment that I did LSD for the first time. And then that really opened my mind up to this, this grid. You could even say this reptilian grid where... The other individual that was in my life that was involved in the underworld, I'd actually been, been seeing him off and on uh, throughout that year again of 1998. Uh, doing a little boxing training at the gym, doing a little bench press, going out to eat a big plate of Chinese food afterwards, more reminiscing about stories from the old days. And the darker aspect of this individual is he was, he was often leading me on to be some sort of... Uh, like he was mentoring me for the underworld, for some role. And he played that part for years because I think it suited his ego. I don't know how much of that he actually took seriously. 
Uh, but throughout my childhood, he did kind of lead me on that he would basically indoctrinate me into a world that he was in. And a lot of it was just, was just bullshit. <laughs> I'm starting to go my own way and I'm realizing that there's a lot of things about this guy that's been so influential aren't so legit. And when I'm doing acid and I'm looking at it, I'm seeing all this demonic stuff around him and that world that he presented to me to be a beautiful world. And I saw the ugliness of the world of hurting people on that acid trip. And I cried and I cried and I cried and something changed inside of me. And I no longer wanted to be like him. I still wanted to fight, train, and be the best that I could, but I didn't want to live his life or his world because his world scared me because now something had opened within my sight and I was looking at a whole other world. I went, friend picked me up and we were, he took me up MLK and during that period there was a lot more gang activity. It was the late 90s and I was freaking out like, what is this place? You know, this place of violence and evil and evil spirits that want to work around people that are involved in the arconic world of dishing out violence. How disgusting. I'm never going to be the same again. And I don't know whether it was because of that event or what, but there were things that were dramatically changing within me and I took some really hard roads um, after that point. You know, in the next podcast, I'm going to begin to talk about the next chapter of my life. And it involves dabbling with a substance for a short period of time that could have ended my life. But between that period of 98 and 99, it was working at Fred Meyer, doing the late night partying with Gunner, or with my friend at the time, <coughs> going to the gym and hanging out with this other individual uh, with this hope that he would actually see me eventually as worthy, because he was also very harsh. You know, he would also be kind of tough, act like he's doing it for my own good, because, you know, there's really something amazing around the corner, which there really never was, but more talk. So I'm living multiple lives, trying to find my way. The top of my head blows off in this acid experience. I'm starting to look at reality a different way. And what happens is me and this other individual start it's it's almost as if we're we're still hanging out, but it's like he knows that I'm not going to be that guy. Or maybe it was a higher like, hey, it's not meant for that kid to be indoctrinated in the underworld. So, I mean, I felt like without that, what was I? Because I had just come out of a traumatized experience with both family members and hadn't really found my niche yet or my voice you know, beyond martial arts and beyond meditation. And it wasn't very long before I found David Icke's books. It wasn't very long before I found other things. We'll get to all that way later on. And then my learning just accelerated and everything started making sense. But at that point in the late 90s, it, there was still a gray area. And it wasn't until I went down a certain road that I learned about jails. That I learned about what it's like to be arrested by the police. That I learned what it was like to be actually be inside a cage for a period of time to be treated like an animal. All that more we'll get into in the next podcast. But in that period of taking the substance, there was so much noise, I guess, generated that night that I was evicted. <laughs> the irony, irony is that the, the lady that called the, the manager to have me evicted was moving out the same day that I was being evicted. So here's my grandfather who co-signed to the rescue again who is helping me uh, move from that apartment to an apartment that I found downtown that at the time I thought would enhance my life. To be a city person. To be a downtown Portland kid with my fake ID who can go out to most of the nightclubs. This is before all the scanners. So I can go to a strip club. I can go to a liquor store if I want. And I remember sitting down And putting on uh, Billy Idol's Eyes Without a Face. As I was in my 350 square foot studio apartment on the fourth floor of the Pearl Court Apartments on 9th and Kearney. It's still there today. Uh, low income housing. You can only make a certain amount to live there. So I paid $450 a month. 
uh, from that period of November 98 to November 99. In that one year, I went down and I went down hard. Just like that. It, 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 it's almost like beyond words, but I survived it. But there was a dark ages that came in, and I, I heard that eyes without a face, and I just knew, as I stared out the window at the downtown Portland skyline, that I was going to be going through some serious shit in that apartment that would change the course of my life forever. <clears throat> and with that, that is going to bring this podcast to a close. Uh, we have covered my life for the most part up until the age of 18. That would be about half of my life. Almost exactly up until this point that I'm now sharing this with the public. And I will be back in the next podcast, whenever that may take place, with the rest of the story.